Hopefully it's going to stay this way again. Um, you know, just because we've had exposure again and I'm going to wear a mask again today and it's weird. I think you guys can hear me okay. Sure. Um, all right. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity once again to look at your word, to examine our confessions. Um, that our confessions are what drives us, uh, uh, reveals your, uh, uh, points us back to your word. Um, and we thank you for the gift that we have of these writings and things from our, from our uh, church fathers. And um, we pray that you would be with us now. Uh, as we as we study and as um, you constantly do as you Lord you reveal new new things to us through your word every day we thank you for all things we give you we give you thanks and praise in Jesus name amen, amen. Um, all right so I think I left off on the, the second commandment so we're going to start I'm on page three of your I'm on page three of your handout. If you're if you're following along with me with any form of the Book of Concord, um, that would be in the large catechism. It's paragraph 49 is where I'm starting. It's kind of where we're at. Do you have extra copies up there? I do. I sure do. I didn't, sorry, I didn't ask. Well, you can look here. There you go. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else need? Yeah, you need an extra copy. You guys ready? There you go. Pastor. Anybody else need one? We good? Okay. I hope so far that you found this to be uh, helpful. Um, I, I am not, certainly not an expert or anything, um, but as I had said, being no. shortly removed from from learning all of this stuff and talking about it um, in the in the uh, book of Concord, um, again, Pastor and I felt it would be maybe beneficial for me to share uh, do a do some teaching on this. So that's why we're here again today. Please, at any time, if I don't make any sense or you want to ask a question, uh, interrupt me any time. And I really like. I, I'm kind of like pastor too. I do like rabbit holes, and I think sometimes that's how we learn things. It's kind of fun when we get into some good discussions. That's that's what makes the Bible study enjoyable. Okay, second commandment. You want to say it with me? You, you are, are not, not to take, take the name, name of God, God in vain. vain. Yeah. So, uh, paragraph 51 in the large catechism says this. And that's what I have written there next. If you are asked, what does the second commandment mean? Or what does it mean to take the name of God in vain or to misuse it? You should answer briefly. It is misusing God's name when we call upon the Lord God, no matter in what way, for purposes of falsehood or, any of, of, uh, or wrong of any kind. Um, let me go ahead and read one more and then let's, let's talk uh, here a little bit. What this commandment forbids, therefore, is appealing to God's name falsely or taking his name upon our lips when our heart knows or should know that the facts are otherwise. For example, when taking oaths in court and when one party lies about the other. God's name cannot be abused more flagrantly than when it is used to support falsehood and deceit. So if you've got all that, if you're following along, anybody want me to repeat anything there? You know, I did these fill in the blanks so you couldn't sit there and fall asleep on them. <laughs> yeah, you can repeat that. that would be good. <clears throat> okay. I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat the whole thing then. Uh, okay. This is... Uh, the paragraph that starts with what this commandment what this commandment forbids therefore is appealing to God's name falsely or taking his name upon our lips when our heart knows or should know that the facts are otherwise for example when taking oaths in court and one party lies about the other God's name cannot be abused more flagrantly than when it is used to, to support falsehood 
and deceit. So, you know, when I, in my catechism class, I was just doing this with the kids uh, one, this past Wednesday night. And immediately, you know where their mind goes when they think about taking God's name in vain. They, swearing. They think swearing. Just yeah. using his name as a swear word. Yes. You know, I don't, I mean, so in a way, there are other things, well, it's not, I guess it's not, uh, you, I think you all understand what I'm saying. There are worse mm -hmm. things about that even, right? It's still right. a sin, no matter what, if we're using his name as a swear word. But what are some of the other examples then? That examples that you can think of. Any, anybody? About how, how we use God's name in vain. Every game show and everything when they're, oh my gosh. Sure. Yeah. That makes me crazy. I always say, yeah, he's my God too. He's amazing. Yeah. Well, and just swearing in general, not even using <coughs> the Lord's name when you're swearing, just swearing in general. Because it's mm -hmm. the... the Yes, be yes, and your no, be no. Mm -hmm. yep. But sometimes people just say the name of Jesus, you know, and if you're surprised and shocked and something terrible is about to happen and you say Jesus, and those of us who know that, that just saying his name is a sin, you know, we just continue and you say, please help me so that you're talking to yeah. Jesus. When you use his name, you need to be talking to him and not and not just saying his name because, I mean, how would you like to have somebody coming around saying, Joe, hey, Joe, 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 I hate this, you know? It's it's not a good thing. That's part of, of doing this, using his name in vain. Okay. okay. So, good. So Luther gives us this, uh, the, the paragraph that I just read here, he gives us this example, right, of swearing of, of oaths in court, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I haven't been in a courtroom for a while. Um, but you're scared. You're like, oh, what does that mean? I haven't been in a courtroom for a while. I think I haven't had a traffic ticket for a long time. But, <laughs> I had to go in and observe some. Has anybody ever gone, been to court, or you've observed cases and that sort of thing? So you see the people jury. when they're sworn the in, sworn in, when the juries are sworn in. You know, well, all court marshals. Yeah, there you go. You would know, Colonel. I know. You know. Court marshal. Yeah. So yeah. So <clears throat> that's a that's a grave abuse if you swear by God that you're going right. to tell the mm -hmm. truth, and then you get in there and you lie. In one of our courtrooms, civil law, what's that called if you lie in court? Perjury. Perjury, right. And you can get in a lot of trouble for doing that. Um, so here's another one. When I, every time I re enlisted in the United States Army, you know, I had to raise my right hand and I swore that I would uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and all that stuff. So help me God, okay? So every time I took that, I, I really thought about it. I took that pretty seriously. That's a, that's a very serious thing. You know? So those of us that have had those kind of experiences as well, that's swearing rightly, right? I'm not using God's name in vain because I, hopefully I, all of us that do that, we do uphold, you know, we do uphold that. You guys, anybody else have any uh, thoughts? Um, so it's okay to take an oath, like for your job, as long as you take it seriously, and you know, even if you say for holy God. Yeah, because I don't. Scripture doesn't know. I think I'm right about this, and I'm trying to remember where it is, but Scripture does not forbid us from swearing mm -hmm. oaths and things like that. I mean, I remember in the one gospel that Ruth was talking about, you know, that it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, you know. But, um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think, Any, anybody help, help the vicar out here this morning? Can you think of, uh, can you think of another 
example of that, Pastor? Can you think of something off your top of your head? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Well, didn't in the Old Testament they would have these oaths that um, they would they would swear these oaths? I mean, they were a little different. You know, kind of wasn't one of them where they maybe I'm getting my story. So were they Nazarite oath? One where they swore an oath by. Splitting an animal in two and walking in <coughs> that one. Yeah, that's, that's the blood and covenant. Then, yeah. And then there's that's the covenant. Yeah. That's the covenant. But then there's one, because we were reading it in our Bible study, and it was this. I remember Colleen got totally like weirded by it because you <coughs> had to swear an oath, but in order, I don't know. It was like. It sounds weird even saying it, but in order to swear the oath, you had to like put your hand on the thigh of the person you're swearing the oath. Right. That was Abraham. Was that Abraham? Yeah. And yeah. That, yeah. I mean, there was more uh -huh. than that. When, when, he, when his servant was supposed to go get a wife for Isaac, mm -hmm. that's what he did. Is that right? No, you're right. Go on. So, <coughs> but that was but an oath. Oh, <coughs> that, that, was, was, that was a cultural common, common right. thing for them to do. Yeah. But he did pray to God about it because yes. he said, you know, unless... This happens. Yeah. Now, you were, um, Don. You were saying about you were saying about the Nazarite vows too, or somebody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, well, so the thing about that was they were taking vows, but they weren't um, taking the vows in order to find favor with God. That's not what that was about. You know, like <coughs> like monasteries were doing, and what the problem was. You know, with the when the Apology and the Augsburg Confession and all that other stuff were being written. So, you know, people were taking, you know, these guys were taking these vows and then going into monasticism because they, they were doing that in order to, taking these vows that uh, it was a way of remitting their sins, right? And we know that there is only one who remits, who remits of sins and that's, that's Jesus our Lord. But uh, so I'm trying to I'm trying to remember about the Nazarene vows though. But they it wasn't about they 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 did uh, they either grew their hair longer or cut it short. They did they did uh, some things. You probably they couldn't, they couldn't cut their hair. They couldn't and, and they hair. couldn't drink any uh, wine. <coughs> right. And uh, it was a it could be a certain a portion of time or it could be a lifetime yeah. things. Um, <coughs> set aside for a holy purpose. Yeah, but again, remember that you got to be careful, you know, and if you're trying to take vows to please God, forget about it. That's not what that's about. That's not what anything right. can do to please God. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to just keep moving on. Uh, the, the, uh, I think this is a really good one to talk about here. This is one of my favorite parts of Luther's uh, discussion about the second commandment, and that's this. But the greatest abuse occurs in spiritual matters which pertain to the conscience when false preachers arise and present their lying nonsense <laughs> as God's word. That's Luther's words right out of the catechism. Okay? And so somebody want to check uh, Exodus 20? Verse 7, and read that for us. I've got that. Okay. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay. For the Lord will not... Um, yeah, give me a second. Yeah, you probably want to just change that, because I was using a different translation. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless... Um, you could just say, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who, who misuses his name, right? Unfortunately, it is now a common affliction throughout the world that there are just as few who do not use God's name for lies and all kinds of wickedness as there are a few who trust in God with their whole heart. So, to keep this in context,
context again, I gave you, gave you a little bit of background, if you remember, you know, the Luther started, his catechism was built out of these visitation articles that they, that they did when it was the uh, elector of Saxony that wanted to have, just, he like sent some people out to inspect the churches and the condition of the churches, meaning not, not the condition of the buildings I'm talking about, but the people and the preaching and teaching and everything else that was going on out there. And then he found that it was, it was deplorable you know, this, there, was, there were no standards, there was nothing. You know, some, and uh, you know, I, I think I shared with you some of his comments uh, up about that too. You know, Luther in his colorful language that he had about, you know, these lying pigs and stuff like that. that you know. I pigs and dogs. <laughs> yes, and how important, and how important it was then to, I think it's okay to, it's a standard, it's a biblical standard, you know, of what, of what should be taught, you know, out there. And so this is, this is where then, then we have the, uh, this is why we have the catechism. And it's important because there's nuance in scripture, right? Can I say that? And then if you, if you, if you misinterpret something, this is, you can see this. If you read, just read the history of the Reformation, you know, Luther's time, we started, that's when we started having all these spin-offs. You know, one of the biggest issues they started having was about the Lord's Supper. I love that, um, I did a great visual of when I read about Luther when he was arguing with some other theologians about this and, uh, you know, he wrote down, apparently he wrote down ist on the table, the German word for is, and he was going ist, ist, ist. You know, it is the Lord's Supper. You know, it, it is my body and blood. That's what the words say in Scripture. And yet, you know, then you had these other theologians that were arguing the other way that, well, they can't be true. How does that become his body and blood? How does that happen? It doesn't make any sense. So what are they doing there? <laughs> Again, we take God's word and we put it here and we go, or put it, you know, and we're trying to say, well, this, this doesn't make sense. This all has to make sense to me, you know. I, I mean, it's a mystery. I was talking to a couple of a couple of pastors about this uh, just just uh, a couple of days ago, and and the idea of how that happens, and it's a it's a it's a glorious thing, and we just all we need is in faith to receive that gift, that great gift that we get in His body and blood when we do that. Isn't it a great thing? Yes. And it doesn't, you know, I don't know how he does it, but, you know, it's awesome when you think that I am joining in communion with all of those saints, even that have gone before us and all of us here in this body, you know, joining, joining in the body of Christ. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. But getting back to what I was saying, that, you know, you, get, you start getting these spinoffs because, you know, everybody's got, start, they start the nuance in scripture and they start misinterpreting. Uh, the Catholic Church back then was really good at this and, and then they started just making up kind of traditions and holding their traditions and ceremonies higher than very pharisaic, right? Than, than what scripture says. Uh, so, um, and so we have, we need to be careful, like, I, I, I will tell you, even when I started teaching this catechism class, I think to myself, I don't want to screw this up with these kids. I really don't. Because I want them to, to learn this and learn it properly, and I don't want to get in the way of that. Lord, help me if I say something that's incorrect or whatever, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's really important that we, we rightly teach, we rightly preach and confess uh, you know, Jesus and him crucified. Yes, Ruth. I had that same issue about 12 years ago when I was teaching little kids. And the pastor at the time, I think it was Pastor Reddish, said, don't worry about what comes out of your mouth when you're teaching the little kids because the Spirit is guiding you and the Spirit is guiding them. And God will allow them to hear what he wants you to hear them to hear. So don't be worried. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, 1 Corinthians 1, 
verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who mm -hmm. are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. And that's the whole thing right there. There you go. It's crazy to people. It, you can't make sense of it. Because it's, it's not a logical thing. And it's not supposed to be. It's faith. We, we trust in God. We trust in his promises. Um, you know, that's all, that's all the first commandment right there. He wants mm -hmm. to give us his good gifts. He wants us to have all these good gifts. He doesn't want to withhold anything from us. That's why he wants us to fear and trust and love him. You know, he has all these wonderful gifts for us. Um, but, you know, as the world's going, certainly as it's going in our country, I mean, you know, Christianity, the idea of faith and all those things is really, it's yeah. not challenged. It's very, it's going to get even more challenging. This is just my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, as the culture continues to be more, to walk further and further from, from, you know, from the word, from God, uh, we see this, you see this also with uh, churches. Uh, you know, we have sister uh, churches out there that are wrongfully, falsely um, interpreting God's word and teaching it to their people that way. You know, that's that's a, that's a pretty serious, serious thing there. And sometimes, for me, it just makes me wonder if when the Lord actually returns, you know, will there be, like when he comes back, will there be an Orthodox church here left? A visible Orthodox yeah. church. You know what I'm saying? That really still truly confesses, um, you know, mm -hmm. the word and everything. And, and uh, I think, again, uh, you know, I, it's why it's so important that we stay grounded in his word. Yep. That's why it's so important that we do that. Okay, I'm on page four, right there at the top. Thus you now understand what it is to take God's name in vain, that is, either simply for purposes of falsehood and to allege God's name for something that is not so, or to curse, swear, conjure, conjure, and in short, to practice whatever wickedness one may. In addition, you must know how to use the name of God properly. With the words, you are not to take the name of God in vain, God at the same time gives us to understand that we are to use his name properly, for it has been revealed and given to us precisely for our use and benefit. And then I have some examples here. As when one swears truly, where there is need and it is demanded, so also when there is right teaching, and when the name is invoked in trouble, or praised and thanked, in prosperity. That gets back to Ruth's comment she was making earlier about uh, Jesus, you know, and if we're going to, we're going to invoke his name and call on his name, we need to do that properly. Anytime we're calling upon God, right? Uh, take somebody want to read their uh, Psalm 50 verse 15, if you have it. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, that's a confirmation verse that's supposed to be memorized. <laughs> <laughs> I know that scripture. Thank you. Yeah, and as I have, uh, you, you heard me say this uh, last week or the week before, but you know, there's so many wonderful promises we have like that found out, found through the Psalms. If you, you know, you read through them. Or God, God tells us he will hear us in trouble. Not just the Psalms, but we, we, we see that throughout, throughout his word. Um, that, that he will hear us. He wants to hear us. He wants, to, wants us to call upon him. Um, unfortunately, you know, because we're sinners and we're human and all those things, a lot of times we're, oh, Lord, help me. I'm in a fix now. Help me. And that's okay. But we, we should be praising him. You know, I, I, know, I like it when pastor says, did you, did you thank God for the very fact that you woke up this morning? Mm -hmm. yep. 
you know, that you, you were able to put your feet down and get out of bed and you and God God kept you through the night. Again, you have breath. Uh, I love living here in the rapid uh, in, in the hills because I wake up and we have these beautiful sunrises and if you're up early, that's worth getting up for. Even and if the old bones are a little creaky, even if the old <laughs> bones still should be thankful. Well, Especially I've got some creaky bones there too. <laughs> what if they didn't hurt at all? What if you thought found out you were dead? <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus, now. Yeah. Let's hurry. <laughs> yeah. So we can, you know, and that's that. You know, I mean, we have that to look forward to. You know, as His saints, your baptism. You are you are a child of God. And, you know, we have that to look forward to. We know what it's going to be like. This is temporal, you know. Jim? We had a prayer in our, in our house one night. And we told the Lord, we said, what if you woke up and you had a billion of those things that you were thinking? That you, you, you have to speak a little louder because you're getting too soft. Right? What if you woke up this morning and only had those things that you thank God for? Oh, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thoughtful, thoughtful, That's a very thoughtful, thoughtful. That's good. Thank you. It's kind of scary, actually. Yeah. You go, thank, thank you, God, for blessing me more than I deserve. Well, amen for that. Yeah. Absolutely. More than I, what is it? Pastor Nor. Saying, how are you doing today? He says, better than I deserve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Nor, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. oh, I remember. Yeah. You know, Vicar, I was just... Um, I think that, among other things, when you are raised in the family, I mean, they bring you to church, you, you know, become a Christian and so forth too, but it's the kind of language that, that your parents use in the household is what you pick up. Mm -hmm. well, and it's just... Well, you, the back. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. my, my dad was in the military in the Second World War uh, for a couple of years. And I'm sure the language was was pretty rough, okay? And then, when I was being raised, though, uh, neither one of my parents basically swore. I mean, whether it took God's name in vain or whatever, but being in the military, I was exposed to a lot of, you know, bad language. And I, you know, I tried to be a good example of not using bad language, but it's because that was the way I was raised. And I guess it amazes me that my Dad was exposed to all that, yet when he got back and raised his family, neither my mom or my dad, I can never remember or ever swear. I don't know how that, you know what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. um, whether, you know, and people, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, you know, it, it, uh, some people it's a second nature to just cuss a blue streak, as we used to say, you know? For nothing. You know, and uh, it's, it's ridiculous. I just have words come. felt fortunate that I was raised in a family. Well, it sounds like to me that your mother and father cared enough about their family to make sure that they. Yeah. And I think you have well, yeah, to you know, always feel fortunate in that, among other things. I mean, whether it be honesty or integrity or or whatever, I just feel fortunate to have been raised in a family like yeah. that. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I'll confess. Uh, be, I was raised. I was raised in a family that I never heard any swear words. And then when I was a 17-year-old kid and I joined the army, that my world changed. Yeah. And then it, when I remember, I'd have to stand there and process when a drill sergeant was yelling at me about something, and the words he was using and the combination of all of those words and everything. It was like, what's he really saying? You know, because I was like, I've never heard. Even where I grew up and with right. my friends, I never heard any of that kind of stuff. You know, and so. Yeah. Well, and even what we talk to our kids about, like teaching second grade and with the election, it's amazing what those kids will say, even in regards to just the election. Well, he's not my president. No, he is your president. Mm -hmm. Like, whether your parents voted for him or not, he's your president. Right. And adult conversations should not be had in front of children. And because they're listening, whether you think you're paying attention they or not, very they're listening. And then they come to school, and the things they say, you're like, where did you hear that? So what are, how are we supposed to handle that then? As, as, 
as as believers and so it kind of gets into a little bit of the kingdom of the left and the right, right, about what Luther talks about. So because I don't like, if we don't like the president that gets elected or something like that, that wasn't our party, that wasn't our candidate, um, what are we supposed to do as believers, as Christians? The fourth First commandment. The fourth commandment. Yeah. Honor those people yeah. that have put you in put in uh, yep, yeah. authority over you. Yeah. Whether you voted for them or not, whether you agree with them or not, you still respect who they are. They're your president. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, especially in the military, I mean, right. he's the commander in chief. Right. And we have to march out smartly, whether we agree with them or not. I mean, that was our job. And, in, that, in, uh, and right. As long as he doesn't cross planes. Correct. This is this is when, this, when, when they begin to go in, against them. scriptures, and we know we know that's happening already. When we see laws that are being made that are unjust mm -hmm. and things, and how long have we had abortion going on in the United yeah. States now? Yeah. You know, it's no different. I, and I'm I'm just echoing Pastor's words because I remember I heard him say this in Bible study one time too that that's no different than what they were doing in the Old Testament when the Israelites got into their, their idol worship and they were started following the practices of sacrificing these babies to, to Moloch, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, we have and, to, uh, yeah. God hasn't put anybody in place that he hasn't wanted there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he used or, every, whether right. they were a heathen king or a, he has used them throughout history for no his purpose. That's right. So we, re and we were talking about this too, because in the, you know, we still receive, uh, we still receive things, part of our, um, what am I trying to say here, in our, in our country, we're still blessed that we have, uh, you know, the peace that we do, the prosperity that we do, and, um, you know, the gifts that, I think Dawn said this a few weeks and it reminded me about that, but you know, the gifts that we receive even from unjust people, from unbelievers, right? Mm -hmm. We still, uh, we, can, we can still expect that, thank you, because um, God uses those people to, to bring us those things for our daily bread, right? Mm -hmm. All of that happens through people that may not be just, you know, at least completely in the sense that we, we think of that. Uh, Ruth? Um, one of the things that I was thinking about is everyone was saying how in their families they didn't hear swearing and so forth. I grew up in a, in a Christian home, in a Lutheran, Missouri Synod home. And I think that everybody is a sinner and everybody slips at one time or another. And what? whether you grow up in a home where you've never heard this or whether it's been around, there's always forgiveness for this, and then you turn. And Amen. I think that's what my parents did, because I can remember my dad coming home and being so angry at things and dropping words like, oh my goodness, he shouldn't be using that. And then he would feel sorry about it, because that's what happens to us. You know, we realize our sin, we ask for forgiveness, and it's gone. Right. And I think that's really the point here is that sure. whether we've heard it or not. Also, when I was working for a construction company, guess what, folks? It is rampant. Am I wrong, Jim? No, you're not wrong. <laughs> and then when you're around this, sometimes it just pops out. And it doesn't mean that you are, are angry. Well, yes, it does mean you're angry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you can be forgiven. <laughs> But it means that after you do it, you realize what you've done and you ask for forgiveness and Christ forgives you and you And he, gives, he forgives us each and every time. We heard that in the gospel. Exactly. Thing, right? the gospel and that's thing. the way it is. Thanks, you, um, Lord. Yeah. I sure need it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I use this ex a personal example, if I may, but when I was living in Baltimore all those years and I taught at the Lutheran school, up on the north side of Baltimore, and I lived on the south side, and I had to drive that beltway every day, back and forth, <laughs> about 20 miles. And Earl, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. having been out there. The, the beltway, the, the, the beltway, it's horrible. Yeah. Out the traffic, and the way people drive, you know, I saw bad accidents on that road, and I'm surprised that I didn't see, see worse than what I did. But, 
you know what, here I am driving off to school to teach my kids, you know, some in, in religion and teach band and all that other stuff, you know, and I'm driving and I'm having a pretty good morning and then some guy cuts me off. I mean, cuts right over in front of me and nearly runs me off the road. I'm not kidding when I, I say that. words for you all to the use time. to him. So yeah. guess what comes out of my mouth? You yeah. can imagine. And before I know it, I'm like, and then the finger wants to start coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all. Well, so why is that? Because I'm a sinner. Yep. You know, and I, yes. We all have anger. And the Lord, the Lord has given me, the Lord, thanks be to God, he's given me more self-control with those things, you know, as, as I, I stay grounded in the word and prayer and all those things. And I would, by the way, I would use that time a lot. I found it was helpful for me to start using that time just to pray mm -hmm. and meditate. Uh, sometimes I'd listen to Bible passages and things like that, but that, that was helpful for me to keep, keep my eyes focused on that and not, not what was going on around me. But, um, you know, and then I get, I get to work and I'm all frazzled and then I have to go in and tell these kids how much Jesus loves them. And I'm thinking about... <laughs> You know, how I want to, you know, I'd like to clobber that guy. And then I've got murder in my heart, right? Because yeah, I'm thinking, oh, man, if he had just flipped over in front of me, you know, boy, I tell you what, that's going to teach him his lesson, right? That'll be the last time he ever does that to somebody. Yeah. And then what, yeah, and you can see, what, what commandments have I, I'm like all of them. That's it. We, of course, we know you break one commandment, that's it. That's doesn't right. matter. You've broken them all. You've try broken to, all of God's laws. Try to say, Beth? Well, people get irritated when a train comes up, you know, and it's like, oh, i got to wait for this train. <laughs> I taught my kids to pray. I said, take that time, shut your car off, and just take that extra time of the day to pray. Mm -hmm. They all do it. You know, that's awesome. That's great. great. Just mm -hmm. pray that's a good idea. and be grateful for the train. Look how many things are gone food. today. Oh, that well, you know, trans <laughs> uh, transport <coughs> something from one to the other. Our trains are still here. You mm -hmm. know, we got yeah. a lot of them here. So just take that time to pray. Be grateful that you have whatever that train is transporting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You may not know what's in it, but exactly. be grateful you have it. Yeah, exactly. We were just talking about that. We could see coal on some coal train when you go through Wyoming, but mm -hmm. we don't know what's going on. Yeah. 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 We got about five, right? Correct. Okay. Um, if we could, let's take a look at these verses I have here in the middle of that page. So if somebody wants to look at Matthew 5, 33 through 37, I've got that one. somebody take a look at 26, 63 to 64, I've got that one. Galatians 1, 20, got and 2 Corinthians 1, 23. Let's just read those. Second Corinthians. Take a look at those real quick here. Matthew 5 says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oath you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And then 26, 63, 64. Yep. But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you, will ha you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the, cl uh, coming on the clouds of heaven. Yeah. So on, on that scripture, he was silent up to that point. He never... Jesus never answered his accuser, right? right? And then when they said that to him, that's when he right. answered. By the living right. God. Speak yeah. up, swear by the living God. Swear, yeah, and he said, yeah, you're right. Then you have to. And then yeah. now you're trying to take your own stone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about Galatians 1.20? In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Yeah. That's St. Paul. St. Paul, yeah. And one more, 2 Corinthians 1, 23. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. 
So we can see examples of, you know, St. Paul there, those last two, you know, rightly, the, the way that he's invoking God, the name, right? So, um, the proper way to honor God's name is to look, look to it for all consolation. If you're following along in your catechism, that's uh, paragraph 70. To look for it for all consolation and therefore to call upon it. Thus we have heard above. First the heart honors God by faith and then the lips by confession. 73, paragraph 73. For this purpose, it also helps to form the habit of commending ourselves each day to God, our soul and body, spouse, children, servants, and all that we have for his protection against every conceivable need. We have prevented the misuse, the last one I have there is, we have prevented the misuse of the divine name and taught its proper use, not only by how we speak, but also by the way we act and live so that everyone may know that God is well pleased with the right use of his name and will just as richly reward it as he will, will terribly punish its misuse. So that's everything that I kind of came together some of the things that I had pulled out of the catechism that I really liked um, for the second commandment. And look at that. It's a good place for us to stop then. So next week we'll finish up with the third commandment, and which means we'll be done with the first table of the law. After that, then we'll dive into the second table. Okay? Um, Randy, would you close us out in prayer this morning? I'd be delighted to. Good and gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for the continued blessings you give us. Uh, thank you for the weather today, the rain that our land so richly deserves and is needed. Thank you for the, the people gathered in fellowship here. Uh, thank you from for, for Vicar Dennis uh, uh, preaching to us your word. Uh, and thank you for Pastor Anderson for uh, giving us uh, your, your rich gifts that you continue to bless us with. All this we ask in your son's most precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.